Welcome to the Binge Breakers Podcast. I'm Jacqueline. I am here to teach you how I overcame bulimia and my binge eating disorder and how you can too. Through simple steps of mind management, repairing your relationship with yourself, understanding your habits, and intuitive eating. Disclaimer, this recording is not intended to be utilized as medical advice or a medical diagnosis. If you think you're in need of medical attention or treatment, please seek it immediately. This recording will also contain sensitive subjects such as binging and purging, weight and depression. Please listen at your own discretion and do what you think is best for you. Hey, you amazing people out there listening to this podcast today. So specific. (laughs) Today's podcast will be a little different. It's not going to be specifically about bulimia recovery, but it will apply to becoming a new person and becoming a recovered person. I wanted to do a podcast on birthday reflections. I just turned 28 and maybe that seems old to you. Maybe that seems young to you. I don't know what it seems to you, but as I've been on this planet now, you know, my 28th year, I feel like I have new reflections and this year feels very similar to the year that I started the podcast and the year that I started the podcast a lot changed for me. I started a new identity of I'm a recovery coach and I'm helping people and I'm doing this. It was scary. I didn't, I I mean, I knew I could help people, but I didn't know everything that I was doing. I learned a lot that year and blew my mind over and over again of what's possible. But then after that, it felt like the two years after that, we're kind of getting in the groove of this is what I do now. This is who I am. And figuring out how do I run a business? How do I help people? How do I help people more? Those sort of things. And so I don't want this podcast to come off as I know everything because I'm, I still hopefully am going to learn a lot more in my life. But I feel like this year and this month has been, yeah, this year and this month has really been similar to that feeling I had in 2020. And of course, the whole world was changing with 2020. We all went through a transformation that year. But I feel, again, that same sense of things are changing, things are altering, I'm becoming a new version of myself. And you do become a new version of yourself every single year, every single day, every single second. But it's felt new and exciting and different and yet overwhelming and confusing and all the things in between at the same time. So I want to talk about how I've been going through that transformation, a bit of the transformations I've noticed myself going through this year. Some of them I'm still working on and I want to keep to myself. I will share on the podcast probably in three to five months from now, but right now I just want to keep those private, but it's exciting stuff. It's good stuff. I just, I'm still working towards how I want to still working on the transformation, but the other things I feel comfortable sharing and just want to talk about it with you guys. So buckle up. Hopefully I always find these when people, other people do podcasts like this, the people I look up to, I love these podcast episodes. So I hope that you guys out there listening, even if this isn't directly related to bulimia recovery, that you still find it useful. Um, If anything, just to show that, you know, I'm human and I'm still growing and learning too. And I, I think I'm, (laughs) I'm a chronic oversharer, so if you haven't recognized that I'm not perfect by now, I don't know, you must be seeing me through a golden light filter, because I certainly make mistakes all the time, but I think podcasts like this really show the humanity and the people you listen to, and my God, whenever I go to Instagram, it's just the most curated lack of personality content I ever did see on there, and people who pretend like they never ever make any mistakes, they're never having issues, it's just not... It's not healthy, man. So hopefully the podcast can help you out with that. So um, one thing I did before this call, I was working on some marketing I had to do and working on some emails and content and copy I wanted to send out. And I was working on an email I sent out probably once a month about like advertising my one-on-one coaching. And I have four spaces available for private coaching this month, which which is kind of crazy to think about. I only have so many spaces. But anyway, I was writing the content and for a second, I felt this feeling of "Mm, people, you shouldn't harass people with your help, your offer. You should just let it go. And then I was just looking through my calendar because I, whenever I come up against objections, something I've been focusing really hard on this year is countering it and developing my thoughts to, you know, what's going to encourage you to do this, to work towards your goal. And I know it's important to help people with my offer. So I was looking through my calendar at just like all the people that I've helped throughout the years since 2020. And I just started writing down names and I'm obviously not going to say those names, but in my, my journal on the note section side, 
I just, every time I saw um, an appointment from an old client or something, I was like, I wrote down that name, wrote down that name. And I wrote down 50 plus names of people that I know are doing well are recovering and I have I think I've worked with over 50 people you know but and some of the clients I've worked with obviously haven't recovered but that's a high percentage of people that have recovered but 85 percent of the people I've worked with have recovered and I just was looking at all these names and even the people that haven't recovered under my watch I do believe I helped them in their journey and they just weren't ready yet to recover. So many people that haven't recovered with me, they've reached back out to me and they had relapses, but then they learned a lot from them and they're doing so much better now. So I, even if they didn't, you know, fully get their results, I know I've impacted these people, but I wrote down all these names and something about it. I was like, you know, this is crazy to think about that. You've interacted with this many people and you've helped this many people with private one-on-one coaching, this isn't even thinking about the group coaching or the podcast or the, the content that you reach with people you've never even interacted with. And it just showed me how much just putting yourself out there and taking action anyway, even though you're scared, even though you're worried, even though you have doubts, can make such an impact in the world. And I would have never thought that. And of course, I know I'm just one person and I have everything figured out, but it was really cool and a good headspace to to start out this podcast with. Um, this year, as you know, I've been working more on trying to actually run a 10K, which is happening in less than two weeks now. It's happening in 10, 11 days. <laughs> it's happening in 11 days. I've been working on that and just the process of running. I was talking with a client who is also doing something new. She's doing Argentinian tango. And we were talking about how the process of just learning a new skill and working on it day in and day out changes you. And running has taught me so much, especially running a longer distance than a 5K. Because I feel like for, for a 5K, you can kind of just go for it and wing it. But a 10K and then longer than that, of course you can do it, but it gets harder and harder to just bullshit and run as fast as you possibly can until it's over. It's taught me a lot about patience and consistency about nourishing my body, although I always felt like I did, but really like if you're running to the value that I'm running at, and I can't even imagine what half marathoners and more people running more than me, you have to be taking care of your body. Sleep is important. And then balancing that with work and my mental health. I've also not drank, I barely drank at all this year, any alcohol. And I've made another podcast episode this month about my relationship with alcohol and how that's changed. But that's been different for the past three months. I haven't drank any alcohol. And then I had some alcohol in Las Vegas and it immediately reminded me of why I really don't drink anymore. It just doesn't seem to have a place in my new identity and my new life. Um, I've been working a lot towards uh, my business and building it into a thing that helps more people. I've been thinking a lot about how can I reach people free and paid that can assist them? And how can I make the best results possible? How can I make the best bulimia recovery program that's accessible to as many people as possible. And I've been trying to think about creative solutions to that and getting better at my coaching, getting better at what I offer. And it's been more of a cementing of this is my identity now. It's no longer a question. I think in 2020, it was me kind of being like, can I do this? Can I be a coach? Can I help people? Do people even want to hear what I want to say? And do I have the validity to do that to where I'm at now, which seems like it's not a question of who I am. I am a coach. I am a, someone who helps people with bulimia recovery. And I'm someone who works, I'm a runner. I'm someone who's running towards 10K. I'm someone who is pretty much sober. I don't really drink that much. It's just crazy to see how much my identity has changed and shifted over the past three months and how much I'm still working towards it. And I feel a lot calmer. I mean, I feel on the flip side, I feel kind of like overwhelmed and excited. And part of the things that are happening, the goals that I've been achieving, like my business is growing, uh, things are getting more successful with that. But and, and more and more people reach out to me. And that has been kind of overwhelming and alarming. It's something I've been wanting and working towards, but it also doesn't match up with the identity that I built for myself. So that's been hard to grapple with. But on the flip side, I feel calm. It's no longer, I, I, there's no longer a doubt for me of whether I can do it. It's just, how do I do it? And how do I keep showing up to the plate? 
So hopefully that was, the, I'm being vague because there's some things that I just don't feel comfortable sharing yet and I'm figuring out how to talk about them and when it's appropriate to talk about them. I will share with you at some point, but I just don't feel like this podcast episode, but it, I've hit a lot of goals that I didn't expect to hit when I started out this year and I had a lot of doubts but I have been able to achieve them and I'm still working towards some of them. So I want to share a bit about how I've done that and what's been helping me create this new identity for myself and and walk into this new 28-year-old Jacqueline, 20, 20, 23 Jacqueline. And yeah, what's what's been working for me? Uh, and I also want to talk about how this can apply to your recovery, because even if you're not trying to start a business or improve your business or run a 10K or whatever other bullshit I'm doing, if you're just trying to live your life and recover from bulimia, that requires you to make an identity change. It requires you to believe new things about yourself, and it requires you to show up to the plate every single day and make changes that are difficult to make. So, I think that this podcast will help you if you're trying to go for that. And I first, even before I get into what I've been doing, I was just on a phone call with a client that I've been working with for a year. Uh, and we have been working on recovery for a full year. She initially started out in my group coaching program, and then she transitioned to doing private coaching with me because she wanted to talk about things, um, that were more private to her that she didn't feel comfortable sharing in the group coaching call. And she has recovered from bulimia. She has fully adopted that identity. And she was telling me about that today. Now we're just working on general stuff. We're just working on her going out and living her life as a recovered person and enjoying things and working on being a little less controlling of her environment. Just cool stuff. But anyway, she at the end of the call was like, I was looking at myself my journal, my bullet journal from, or not a bullet journal, one line journal from last year. And she said the comparisons of the lines that I wrote day by day to now are so vastly different. And I was just feeling so grateful for being recovered the other day. It was a completely normal day. Nothing special was happening. But this gratitude that I had for being recovered made the whole day so much better that I'm not dealing with that anymore. I may still have issues. I may still, like she's dealing with um, some aches and pains going on that she's not sure what's what's happening. She's needing medical attention for that. But She's dealing with with hard shit and stress right now, but she said just being recovered has made it so much better. And I asked her then because she was so confident about it. I was like, "What? What do you think were the main things that helped you recover? You know, if you had to sum it up into these simple things." And and I was like, "And you can't say me." <laughs> she wants to like put responsibility on me, but I was a part of it. But she said, "Learning to finally not argue back." And she said, what was good about the group coaching program that I did with you is that on the calls, I was too nervous to rebuttal some of your advice. So I just had to kind of take the advice that you gave me on specific issues and fight with it on my own. And that actually helped me just take action on things that I needed to take action with and not make pointless roundabout arguments for things that I knew that weren't working for me. Uh, which is hilarious, but um, a really good effect from it. She said, I also had to believe that it wasn't impossible. Some one of the first things you said to me was, what if it was possible that you could gain weight and not hate yourself? And it 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 flipped her mind onto what was what was going to be possible for her in recovery. And that maybe she wasn't thinking of all options. She was only thinking either I gain weight and recover and hate myself, or I stay the same weight and I don't recover, and I still hate myself. And I offered her the idea that maybe neither, neither of those are true, and it's possible that you could live a life that's recovered and be okay and change. Uh, so believing in herself, believing it was possible. She also said having someone else believe in me was crucial, and I think that that's helpful, and that's what I've been doing a lot too, which I'll talk about. But you know, as a coach, something that I do for people is I believe in them, right? And I believe in them. I work on that belief all the time as to why anyone who crosses my path can recover because if I don't believe in the client, then they're going to sense that. And then I'm not going to coach them hard. I'm not going to show up to the plate. I'm not going to find solutions. I'll just jump in the pool with them and, and think, yeah, you can't recover. Oh my God. So I work hard on that belief all the time. And I think that helped her. And then she also said, um, actually taking action, right? So just trying something moving forward. And a lot of our coaching throughout the year was her 
kind of being like, I don't know if I want to do it. I'm not sure if I'm going to do it. I can't do it, but maybe we should do it. And then finally trying it. And then once she took action that pushed her forward in recovery and she learned so much more from that. So those are, that's the advice of how she changed her, her identity. And it's basically belief, not arguing for her eating disorder, trying and taking action and having someone else believe in her. So belief in herself and then having someone else believe in her too. I thought that was magical advice. And that's a lot of what I've been doing this year. And that's what I've been doing since I recovered and since 2020. (laughs) And it's helped me out a lot. But I think in between 2020 and and, uh, now, I kind of fell off the wagon with, I was journaling, but I wasn't journaling regularly. And I wasn't being so intentional about my journaling for the past three, now four months. I have been religiously journaling every single morning. And it's not what you think. It's not... um, it's not like a whole hour long session of journaling. I think that's excessive and nobody's got time for that. If you do, then good for you, I guess. But I've just been journaling um, every single day what I want to intentionally focus on. So every single day I write out my goals. Like one of my goals is run a 10K race. And then I write down, that's my annual goal, right? Which I'm going to hit and probably bump up after that this month. But then I'll write down my monthly goal right next to it, which is whatever I'm supposed to be running that month you know, and today, this month, it's run the 10k race, because I have it scheduled. But previous months, it would be run a 10k on your own, run a 6k and like start bumping up that number. And then I would write weekly, run what's the mileage you want to run for this week. And just writing down all those goals, one of my one of my big goals, too, is to be completely debt free by the end of the year. So I'd write down things like budget this month and that sort of stuff. And another goal is relationship things. So like um, just spending time and quality with my friends, my boyfriend and family. So writing down those goals, but writing those things down, just the same goals every single day. It seems monotonous, but it kept my mind focused on this is what we're working towards, even if I knew it and it. I had the temptation every day to be like, I know these goals. Why do I need to write them down? But something about writing them down, even if I didn't do anything else, helps me realize and keep my mind focused on, no, this is what we're working towards. This is why we're showing up today. That's what we want to do. And that's what's important to us. And just writing it down constantly helps me um, in the mornings. And then I would write down various questions. But the questions I think I ask myself most often were firstly, what thoughts are going to help you? What thoughts do you want to focus on today that will help you move closer to your goal? And I would write about an intentional thoughts that would that I was uh, that would help me. One of them was, I'm becoming a 10K runner. I am a 10K runner. I ran a 10K now. I'm working towards this goal. I will be a 10K runner. Just simple identity shift affirmations. And I was didn't first. I wasn't. You know, I'm a 10K runner. I'm not. But I would always crucially say. I'm, I am becoming a 10 K runner. That's what I'm doing because I was literally doing that. So I would say those things and a way you could apply that to recovery. If your main goal is to recover from bulimia, you could write down daily. I am working towards recovering from bulimia. I'm becoming a recovered person. I'm doing what a recovered person does today, which is working towards their recovery. So there's simple shifts you can make, but that sort of thinking really kept me focused on this is who I'm becoming this is what I am. And it affirmed that identity and made it easier once I finally hit that goal, because now I am a 10K runner. I've run 10K many a times now, and I'm prepared for the race, even though I'm going to be slow. I'm not a fast runner. I think my best pace was like 10, 30, 11. But anyway, I am still a 10K runner and that is great. And I have that identity affirmed. But if I had not practiced the thoughts along the way of who I am and who I'm becoming, it might seem more foreign and not really match up with the identity that I built for myself. Same with recovery. I find a lot of people, they work and work and work towards recovery, but they never really focus on intentional thinking about belief in themselves. Just like my client said, like believing that they are, it is actually possible and that they are becoming who they said they're becoming. And then once they finally reach the goal, they kind of freak out. And like, this doesn't match up with my identity. It'll still feel foreign when you get there, when you achieve the goals. But I think it's easier when you practice thoughts along the way. And then another thing I would write down daily, um, pretty much daily, which was, uh, what are you working on today that will push you towards these goals? And that just made, sh- I'm, it, it made it me think about how am I spending my time in a more leveled up version than I had before. And something I did this year too, was I stopped wasting so much time on things that weren't 
pushing my business forward or my goals forward or my relationships forward. And I narrowed my focus on very few goals. And I've got, you know, lots of long-term goals. I'm an idea person. So I'm constantly thinking of new things I should be doing. My mind's very active, but staying focused on very few things and spending my time on very few things has allowed me to move faster in these areas because I'm hyper fixated on them. I find a recovery, something people, a big mistake people make is they constantly try to focus on weight loss and recovery at the same time. And you know me, I'm not opposed to weight loss. I don't think it's a bad thing as long as you're doing it in a way that's healthy, safe, and sustainable long-term. But what I see people do is they try to do recovering weight loss at the same time. And it's just so conflicting. It's not the best thing to do. And you're going to kind of come up against uh, uh, the weight loss is basically going to hinder your recovery process. And then what happens because of that is you don't make progress on either area because you're trying to do two totally contradictory things. And so you just stall. And then you think I can't lose weight and I can't recover. Really, it's just that you need to focus on one at a time. And that's what I've done for my own life is I'm focusing on the 10K, focusing on being debt-free, focusing on some other personal goals. And that's about it. Like I'm not focusing on much more than that. Now, all those things like debt-free, uh, business goals, personal goals, and then they, um, what is the other thing? The 10K? I think I said that already. Those things though, take a lot of work. They require a lot of work and changing your identity. So it's not to say that they're not a lot of, lot to do, but still just focusing Hyperfixating my time and what I'm spending my time on has been very helpful for actually moving forward in my life. Um, and then I would also write down things like, and I heard this, this these questions from Corinne Trab Crabtree, and they helped me out so much, which was, you know, how am I likely to show up today, and how do I need to show up today? I'd write that down, that question down a lot because it would show me, which is what I do a lot with my clients the exact behaviors I needed to watch out for, the challenges that would come into play. And my biggest thing right now I'm working on is just being tired at the end of the day and not wanting to do anything. And I will always have the thought of, oh, I could do it tomorrow. Oh, it's not super important if I don't do it today. Mm, it's not a big deal. Watching out for that behavior, writing down the fact that I will likely engage in that sort of behavior, and then writing down how I want to show up instead. And even if I only showed up 1% better than I did the following day, it's been an improvement and it's helped me navigate those um, unintentional behaviors and then react differently and be more intentional with it. And with clients all the time on calls, people always wonder like, what do you, what is a coaching call? A lot of times what I do is I help set goals for clients, but then we talk about, okay, what challenges do you think are going to come up? What do you think is going to prevent you from actually achieving these goals? Because most of the time people know what to do. Not always. Sometimes they have blind spots and I help them out with that. But a lot of times they just forget that they're a human being and they've got these uh, these habits in place. They've got these unhelpful thoughts in place, these systems in place, and that's what you need to navigate. And so writing down the question of how am I likely to show up versus how do I want to show up for these things and how do I need to show up for these things really makes you think, okay, if I'm trying to become this person, what do I need to do today? And how do I need to show up differently than I have previously? And that's helped me change my identity quite a bit. So it's the first thing that's helped me with this year and making the amount of progress I've made has been being super focused and journaling. And all of that, I know it sounds like a lot, but it, it literally takes me 10 minutes, 15 minutes if I have a lot to say or I'm having a bad day and I need to vent. But it doesn't take me that long to write down this page of questioning and, and the goals that I have, like the four or five goals that I have that doesn't take that long. So if you're thinking, I don't have time for journaling, I don't have time to be super focused. I want you to question, you know, what is important to you? And if you keep forgetting these things, you want to work towards these things, but you never seem to have time. I find setting aside 10 to 15 minutes in the beginning of my day before everything gets started helps me be much more intentional versus reactive. Because when you're just reactive, you're just reacting to everything going on around you and you're not actually focusing on what's important, which is maybe recovery to you, maybe it's something else. But that's been helpful. Another thing that I've been doing, which I think I always used to make it a problem, but something I've been really good at this year, because last month I um, achieved a new level in my business and I had an immediate identity crisis. And I was like, this isn't me. I'm not this successful. This doesn't happen. I don't help this many people. No, 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 no. This isn't me. And instead of making it mean that I needed to go do thought work and change what I was thinking and uh, 
you know, alter that and behave differently. I remember saying to myself, this is part of what it's like to be a business owner, to be someone who's being successful like this, to reach new heights and help more people. Because of course you would feel like this doesn't match up with your identity. Of course you'd feel confused. It's new territory. Of course you wouldn't know exactly what you're doing. And of course it would feel like it doesn't match up their identity and you feel cognitive dissonance. Of course, all these things were happening. So I still felt confused, overwhelmed, excited, nervous, like I wanted to throw up, but still continuing on and, and still kind of scared and nervous. But I didn't make it a problem, which I think is a lot to like, this podcast is going to be all over the place. I'm so sorry. But with bulimia recovery, people, when they're showing up, I wrote this post last month, they start doing things that don't align with who they are. And then they feel nervous and they feel like they don't understand what's going on. And they feel like, mm, I'm not sure if I can handle this or keep this up. There's all this uncertainty that happens. There's all this thing, this, these things that they do that don't match up with their identity. And then they make it a problem. And then they start to take, they start to self-sabotage and go back to what they were doing before because they can't handle this new kind of version of themselves. I feel like a lot of bulimia recovery is just accepting the fact that of course you feel overwhelmed. Of course you feel confused. Of course you feel annoyed and tired and angry, you just took out a major coping mechanism and you're learning to build new habits and learning to eat in different ways. And your body is potentially being bloated and uncomfortable because you're actually digesting food again and all these sorts of things, of course. And so bulimia recovery is a lot of emotional intolerance, basically, and learning to cope with those emotions without engaging in behaviors. This transformation that I've had this year has been the same thing of just tolerating confusion, overwhelm, self-doubt, fear, um, excitement, nervousness, unknown, whatever it is, and not making it a problem, which has been so helpful. And even telling myself things like, this is probably what a 10K runner feels. This is probably what a successful business owner feels. This is you're right on track, not making it a problem. So that's been helpful for me too, and not trying to solve it. Of course, I would sometimes, if I really thought it was really bothering me, I'd go through it. Um, but yeah, it wasn't too bad. And then also something I've been doing, which of course I would, but I've been definitely focused on my own coaching and mental health, making sure I'm getting weekly coaching. And if I miss it for one week, I try to go right back to it, but getting weekly mindset coaching on big stuff and stupid stuff. You know, if there's something that's taking up a lot of my mental drama, I talk about it no matter how small it is, like getting coaching on the dishes and who's doing them in the household, you know, and like the drama I have with that or, or anything that's bothering me in my personal life. And then getting coaching on the drama that I had around the goals that I'm achieving in my business and helping people, all that sort of stuff. And I don't think people realize that getting outside perspectives and objective opinions and having a safe place just to vent your thoughts and move forward, I think that is what coaching is. And it's so incredibly helpful because when you're just left to your own devices, you, I was talking to a client about this, you, you become someone who talks to a volleyball, right? Like if we, there's a reason we need to have other people. And so something that's helped me tremendously this year. And I've, I've obviously invested in coaching in the past last year, I've invested in coaching with Megan Tong, but I wasn't as regular near the end of the year with getting weekly coaching for just whatever I needed. But this, this month, or this, these past three months, I've been very vigilant about, I'm getting my weekly coaching. I'm, I'm asking questions and I, I'm a part of a few coaching groups. And if I don't have access to a coaching call that week or something, usually I have access to one, maybe I need more. I will ask questions and write about what my problems are and just not waste time in stewing, trying to figure it out a lot on my own. I've been trying to use other resources and help as much as possible. And I find that most people, when they're trying to do it all on their own. Maybe they're successful, but it's just so much extra work, so much extra work that you don't need to be doing. And you're going to probably get success faster if you just accept help from other people. So that's been something I've been doing. And obviously people I work with, they're getting help from me and others in the groups. So that's been, it's been helpful. I've been trying to fill my head almost daily, but of course, you know, I'm human. I don't always look at educational content, but I'm trying to fill my head every day with some sort of educational content, which I like to think I do, but you know, I wasn't always doing it as regularly. So some sort of learning thing for at least 30 minutes um, to an hour. And of course I'd be doing things during this sometimes like washing dishes or whatever. We got a multitask, we have a life, but I've, I also was trying to 
um, fill my head with stories of people on the same journey as me, filling my head with people that have been uh, down the same path as me, trying to learn from them, trying to just take notes and watch and listen and, and fill my head with looking at them and not using their success against me, but saying, this is possible for them. This is possible for me. This is possible for them. This is possible for me. I see a lot of people compare themselves to maybe me or other people in other success stories I've shared on this podcast. And they think, well, I'm the exception. Those people are special. I can't do it. And something I did when I was recovering, something I did when I started the podcast and something I'm doing hardcore now is listening to other people who've gone before me, who are smarter than me, who are more inspiring than me and trying to learn from them and not telling myself they're better than you, but telling you, telling myself they're humans too. And if they can do it, so can I. And that has been very good. And something I'll talk about, I'm doing a, not reinvention program, but a program inside the Bulimia Breakup Program. So I'm doing a workshop inside the Bulimia Breakup Program called uh, Recovered You. I'm not sure what I'm going to call it yet, but it's it's basically the, the general topic is becoming you without bulimia moving on completely from bulimia and taking that last step of finally just being recovered and who you want to be without your eating disorder or without the identity of in recovery or whatever. And part of that, I'm going to be sharing my post-recovery story. I talk a lot about how I recovered and what I did during recovery. I don't talk a lot about how I moved on from just the stage of being in recovery to just being recovered. And that's what this workshop is going to be about. But I will share something I did a lot in the first year of recovery was I did a lot of meetup groups and I started just I started a random sketch club group in my my hometown, not because I was trying to start a business, but of course, like I'm just naturally entrepreneurial, I think. But it just got me out of the shell and I was like, oh, there's a need for this. Um, like I want to do sketching with people. There's no sketching groups out there, so I'm gonna start one. And then it was successful and threw me into this this thing where I was like hosting sketch clubs each week um in, in a local coffee shop. And then I started this women's entrepreneurial group in the area until until COVID changed things later on. But but the reason I originally started the women's entrepreneur, entrepreneurial group is because I wanted to surround myself with other women business owners who were going through the same journey as me. And so that's also what I'm doing right now is making sure I'm putting myself in rooms, in groups online, in podcast environments that of people that are on the same journey with me. I've tried to make good friends on Instagram of colleagues on the same journey as me and talk with them on a semi-regular basis, just constantly filling my mind with evidence of what's possible for me and making sure I'm surrounding myself with the right people that are also encouraging me and uplifting me and showing me different ideas and helping me versus bringing me down. I actually um, met a friend online in person here who's also a coach and it's just been so enriching to have someone nearby because as an online entrepreneur coach, you don't meet a lot of people in person, but it's been so nice to just have that environment. I can feel the energy when I'm with this person. Um, she's also doing cool things in her group and we're in similar similar niches. So it's just great to have that energy. And I think that's really cemented my identity of, especially when you have someone mirroring an opinion to you, you have other people telling you, you are this person. It's not just your own thoughts anymore. It's other people. So that's helped me change my identity as well. And then something I have been also doing is just celebrating the fuck out of small wins. So when I first started my 10K journey, I could barely run one to two miles. And I felt pretty shitty about that because I was like, I ran more often in Miami. What's wrong with me? But I was never super consistent with it. And I always run and then like pause halfway, which is fine if you need to do that. But I could barely run one or two miles when I started this in Colorado, which, you know, high altitude that also affects you. But this in January, I could barely run, barely run one to two miles. And even then I would probably have to walk and stop. But I started just going for it. And every single run, I was like, good for you. You did it. We've got time. Let's keep moving forward. This is amazing. And even now when I'm doing runs and now a shitty run for me is when I can't run over five miles and I need to take a break and I need to walk or I run seven miles, but I need to take a break and walk midway through or something. Or my run, I'm able to run seven miles. Part of it's up a gigantic hill and I just run really slowly. And that's kind of a loss for me. But 
no matter what it is, even if it's a shitty run, I celebrate it. I'm proud of myself. I cheer myself on. Every time I have a good coaching session with a client and I help them in some sort of way, I cheer on that client. I cheer on myself for helping them do that. Every time I sign on a new client or there's a new group coaching member or someone says something nice to me on the Insta- on Instagram, I always try to celebrate that win. And even if I just have an awful day, but I still showed up and I don't go back to behaviors, I don't turn to alcohol, I don't um, beat myself up, I try to celebrate that too. And something I do weekly is review the wins that I had. And sometimes I'll leave myself little sticky notes um, for the mornings, especially if I know it's going to be a really tough day, just little love notes for myself, which I know sounds so indulgent, but there'll be little love notes of good job, Jacqueline. Um, you can do it today. You've been working so hard. What is, um, something I wrote to myself? Mm, Oh, I can't find it. Um, one of them was like, you'll be okay no matter what. And another one was like, we're so proud of all you that you've been doing. Thank you for doing that. I've even taken videos of myself, just a, a journal entries where I've been talking about the, the things that I'm doing well and the things that I'm doing not so well in a kind, constructive way. Uh, it's just been very, very helpful. So the more you can kind of reflect on your wins, I feel like that just builds momentum. And applying that to recovery, something I helped clients with and in the group coaching program as well, I try to make posts sometimes that are like, celebrate your wins. What's your biggest win from this week? Because I know I'm all about taking responsibility for the crappy things you're doing. Like we need to take responsibility for our actions that are leading to results that aren't so great. But something where we seem to be terrible at that's equally important is taking responsibility for the, the wins, even the smallest wins. And what I see clients do all the time, and I like I have a tendency to do this too, is oh, well, that's not a big deal though. That should be basic. Everyone should be able to do that. And one, I don't know where they're getting their facts from because a lot of people struggle with the things that they're talking about, the wins that they're having. Like most people, a lot of people struggle with food, especially in modern times in America, lots of people struggle with food. Um, And wherever you are in the world, I'm sure there's lots of people struggling with food there. But they don't give themselves credit or they say it's a basic win, but what they don't realize is those little bits that they're doing, those like the, the a day where they don't pit, purge after a binge or they don't pur- binge as much, they slow it down, they pause and they're kind of nice to themselves, even though they did behaviors. Those little things are what build up to recovery and create recovery. So celebrating those things allows you to see not only that you are becoming this new person, you're changing your identity, you're going through a transformation, but it also helps you see what's working. And that's maybe the final thing I'll say is that I've been really trying to to review, okay, what's working, what's not working. And then again, refining my time to what's working, stopping what's not working. (laughs) Something I always tell my clients is like, what, what went well this week? And then what didn't go so well this week and why? So we understand what's not going right. And then we can focus on the actions that are actually working for them and tailor it to them in in a specific way. So, uh, yeah, anyway, hopefully this podcast episode has been helpful. I know it was kind of all over the place because it was birthday reflections, but I'm just feeling a big sense of gratefulness. And I want to say thank you for those of you guys out there listening. Um, I know this has kind of been an episode all about me and maybe it sounds like I'm bragging, but hopefully you're taking this episode and seeing it as this person is just a completely normal person and she's able to run a business and help people and be active still after recovery exercise achieve physique goals and stuff like that and she's also able to be happy and have friends and a relationship she's able to eat cake and still achieve her goals like there's all these things that are going on for me and of course my life's not perfect i still have problems uh like anyone but if it's possible for me i hope you're taking it and realizing it's possible for you too it's not impossible what i'm doing it's totally possible for you too. Just like it was possible that if I recovered, you can recover too. So I hope that this podcast inspires you, if anything, and you take some lessons from my transformation. And thank you, because if you didn't ever listen to this podcast, uh, I couldn't do what I do. You couldn't, I couldn't reach the people. And because you listened to this podcast, hundreds, if not thousands of people have been helped. I mean, just this list of names that I have here, 50 plus people, it's not even all of them. I stopped counting after a while, but those people are living their lives and they're recovered and they don't have to worry about bulimia anymore. And they're working on other problems in their life. Some of them started businesses. Some of them have gotten married and had kids and all this cool stuff. So yeah, if you hadn't supported me in the beginning, then that wouldn't have happened. So thank you. I really appreciate that. 
uh, I, I can't believe that that's my reality now. But uh, I hope that you found this podcast episode helpful. Uh, if you are interested in the April workshop, it's going to be a lot of what I just said here. Um, and it's going to be about how to move again past recovery and just finalize the, the identity that you are recovered. And it was okay to claim that identity now and how to become a person who's not constantly obsessed with food and has other interests outside of fitness and food and their body weight and just exploring that. I can't I can't help you, you know, decide who you're going to be, but can help ask questions and help you start taking actions towards becoming that person. And that's what this workshop is going to be. Some actionable tools and questions that you can write about and think about to do that, uh, which is what I've been helping a lot of clients with lately. Um, also, those of you guys that follow me on Instagram, I did a general life coaching offer last month that was time limited. And I took on quite a few people for that. So in a few months, probably next month, I'll offer that again, not this month. I only have four spaces open for my formal bulimia recovery coaching program. But next month, I'll probably do that again because it's been fun coaching people on things that are business related and how to move on from bulimia and how to just be normal around food. Um, you know, some people, they want to recover from bulimia, but they don't know how to just structure their day and move to that fully recovered version of themselves. So that's what I've been helping people with. And it's been a lot of fun. All right, I'll let you guys go. Um, if you're, I saw your birthday over here. Uh, happy, happy birthday. <laughs> and also some a last little lesson I want to say is that I've also just been trying to act my age and age is subjective, right? Age is what you want to make it. But sometimes I think I pretend I'm like a 40 year old woman or even a 60 year old woman. And that can be good, I think. But I, I keep, I put so much pressure on myself. I still do that a lot. And I think I need to have everything figured out all the time. And I've stopped doing that so much. I'm still putting pressure on myself, but I'm putting pressure on myself for things that I want to do versus feeling, feeling like I have to prove it to other people that I'm successful. And something also one of my friends said, so I always assume that my friends and family think I'm just crazy for what I'm doing. Like they think I'm just have a pretend job and that I'm, <laughs> I'm going to quit it at some point and try to get a real job. That was kind of the story I told myself, but one of my friends reached out to me and she was, said, happy birthday. And she said, it's been so inspiring to see you follow your dreams. It's been really helpful to watch a friend do that. And I was so taken aback. I love this friend too. We talk all the time, but I just, I realized I've been telling myself the story that people think I'm crazy. Um, people that aren't involved in my business, they think I'm crazy watching from the outside. Like, oh yeah, sure. You're a coach and sure you, you have a successful business and you help people. Sure. But her just telling me that made me realize that I'm not crazy. And this is actually cool that I'm following my dreams. And some people will judge me, but I'm not trying to prove things to them. So I think this year it's been a lot more about like, what do I want? And only focusing on that and the pressure I'm putting myself on myself, which still probably is too much. I still probably need to look into that. It's been more from me and me alone. And what do I want to do? And really focusing on just actually being a bit selfish and taking care of myself and doing the things that I want to do. Um, and I also stopped putting so much pressure on myself. I had this weird thing. It was like, I need to buy a house this year. I need to have, um, I need to be married this year. And I need to also have a house before I'm 30 and all this sort of shit. And I've just chilled the fuck out. I'm like, why don't, why would I want to, I don't have to buy a house right now. There's plenty of people over 30 there's plenty of people that go their whole life without buying it. Like I want to own a home at some point, but like, I don't need to do it right now. And that has been, and I'm like, I don't know why I was so obsessed with that, but that that's also been something I've been focusing on. If like Jacqueline, you're 28, like you don't need to buy a house right now. You don't ever have to do that if you don't want to. You don't have to get married right now. You don't have to have kids right now. You don't have to do any of that shit right now. You can just chill the fuck out. So if you learn anything from this podcast, it's believe in yourself. Stay focused on the small goals and chill the fuck out. And actually, if you think everyone thinks you're crazy, that might not actually be the case. Maybe you're actually pretty cool and you're inspiring people without even know it, knowing it. Anyway, I I don't know if I'll post this, but I'm going to try to be vulnerable and post it anyway. <laughs> so nervous. Oh, such a chronic oversharer I am. But that but that's what makes me a good podcast host, I think, and a good coach. I feel like I relate to people quite well. All right, we're going to stop it. We're going to stop the, the rant here. I hope you guys have a good weekend. Never give up on yourself. And I hope you can apply a lot of this to your bulimia recovery. All right, bye. I
Hey, if you found this episode helpful, check out my website at bingebreakers.com. It has free courses, awesome group coaching, and private coaching available to you right now. Thank you.